Welcome to GUI and in web browsers weekly call for 29th of January 2020. Uh, we got action packed agenda this week and people packed gallery view on our call. So if anyone uh, has any issues uh, or topics uh, you want to discuss this week, add them uh, to agenda. Uh, to make it uh, faster, I'll just start with the first one, uh, which was added by me. Uh, so it's more like a PSA for wider community that a lot of uh, uh, things related to async await refactor will finally land in uh, like developer facing uh, and uh, and user libraries, namely JSAPFS and JSDP2P. Um, so uh, it's just a quick uh, notice that uh, there are API changes and details of those API changes are in uh, release notes for respective releases. Um, everyone spent time to document this, so I won't make it longer than I need to. It's pretty well written. Uh, Alan also made a guide for JSAPFS users who want to, uh, the users, uh, user developers who, and who would like to migrate to this new API. There are some best practices and some uh, command specific tips how to do that. Um, and the final thought I want to end this section with is that our libraries got really small after this refactor. For example, this is like IPFS HTTP client and the pre-release version after the refactor gets pretty small after all the new stuff gets dropped. Um, so some of those releases already landed, some will be released uh, very soon. Uh, next steps for like browsers and GUI folks will be to uh, go over IPFS web UI, companion and desktop, uh, and switch them. Uh, to some there are already PRs, uh, but that's like ongoing effort. Um, if uh, anyone has any questions related to migration, uh, probably a good place would be uh, to comment on the release issue for now. Uh, or ask on IRC channel. Um, that's the end of PSA about async await. I hope it was not uh, too long, but I feel it's really important to mention it everywhere. <laughs> it, does it does it affect uh, you know ba backwards compatibility? So, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that this is a pretty this is a breaking change from consumer APIs standpoint. So people that are upgrading to these newer versions need to rewrite all their code to be able to use the async wait API. Yeah, so like uh, to be very specific what is breaking, uh, the breaking change is the programma programmatic interface in JavaScript. We don't change HTTP API, we don't change like core APIs on the high level, like abstraction level. We just change the way those core APIs are represented in JS. So instead of using old uh, promises and callbacks, we are using uh, modern async await uh, constructs. And that was also an opportunity to do some cleanup. So some stuff got simplified. Hopefully it will be better for people, uh, easier to do that. How, how far, do we know how, how far uh, away we are from, from that work being completed in uh, the other bits that are listed here. So the P2P, uh, the web UI and desktop is that, the lib P2P works already long ongoing, right? Um, but have we really started on migrating our other projects to these new APIs? Like web yeah. UI and desktop? I think there's a PR for either web UI or desktop. The thing is like both IPFS web UI and desktop will only need to switch to the new HTTP client. Uh, IPFS Companion needs to switch to both new HTTP client, but also it uses embedded JSAPFS in Brave and in Chromium. Uh, so that will take a bit more 
uh, effort, but hopefully those are the same changes. Like the way Companion is implemented, it does not really care. Is it using a client or a full node? It's the same programmatic interface. So it's just one change of the way we handle programmatic interface. Uh, and we should be good. Q1 OQRs maybe. Hi, I added that one. This, this is an odd quarter. We're having a meeting soon team people in one place but until then uh knowing knowing what um the goals are for these specific areas for for q1 it's gonna be really important especially given that there's some moving around of, of teams and priorities and such uh but uh specifically around the desktop and web ui um making sure that we have a, an okr for guarantee like i guess making sure that we have the same approach that we've had before for the last two quarters for these specific areas, which is ensuring that there's no breakage as new versions of Go IPFS are released. And given there's a very important version of Go IPFS, one, we have the, the new dot that released the, uh, this week, but then ha preparing for 0.5 and making sure that, that these uh, web UI and desktop function correctly with 0.5 is going to be a priority. So, um, uh, we should probably have an OKR specifically around that for this quarter. But I think that the end-to-end -end, end -end testing landing to some extent might meet the requirement there. Yeah, for, like for sure, uh, part of like switching to async, uh, those new uh, APIs will be part of the maintenance job. and. Uh, that and also like tests, uh, we had some, uh, I think Hugo uh, linked uh, a, another project which could enable us to test on both uh, Firefox and Safari, I think. Um, so we could like bundle all, the, all this work into some like maintenance OKR. Um, next. That, that would be, fa that sounds great. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, I was not able to like find the right line. <laughs> Guiding principles for browser integrations. Uh, should I do this one or do you want to? Yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, I'll, I'll give a, a quick context and then, and then you, you can add some more detail. What, we, had a, we had some changes in the November timeframe, I think, around kind of how we handled redirects for in Companion. Uh, when we encountered a DNS link site. So um, this brought up some questions around how we do URLs generally, uh, ongoing security model questions we'd had around path-based security model or path-based uh, gateway uh, and the migration to CID and subdomain to be able to ensure origin isolation. So for example, if you have a, two websites that you both load through the gateway and their CIDs are in paths, uh, they share the same origin, which means they can read each other's local storage. They have the same cookie sessions. As a, in, in the web browser world, that's a very significant problem. Uh, so the short-term solution here was to move to CIDs and subdomains, which means that every CID has its own origin. Uh, this guarantees the isolation and safety of applications that are actually running and not static content in, in, in these URLs. Um, but out of that came a conversation around what does that mean for architectural lock-in? Like what, what, kind of, what kind of architectural decisions uh, are, have been made as a side effect of moving to that kind of a model? How does it affect our long-term ability towards better integration with the web? What does it mean for an application model for IPFS? Uh, it, it, from a, from a th threat standpoint, um, if we had I IPFS as a native protocol, does it have things like cookies and local storage? Do, do these concepts even translate to a, a world where we're thinking about what native IPFS means? Uh, or, or is that just, is it just a static content delivery protocol? Um, we, we don't have, really have a lot of answers for, for where we want to be yet. Uh, I think a lot of us are really interested in what an application model for IPFS could be. But until then, we have this existing web application model and all of the world that it pulls in with it. So uh, it, including this origin-based security model. So this is what this prompted is a conversation around how we make changes to how companion works, how we make decisions 
around how browser integration works generally in the HTTP web when loading IPFS content. Uh, so Lytle, maybe you have some thoughts around, um, we've, we've just kind of really started talking about this, but how, we, how, we, how that actually is articulated in our work here when we're making decisions about how things like companions should work. Yeah, I think like um, for a long time we've been following uh, something uh, a lot of people call the upgrade path, which may not be the best wording. I mean, it's technically correct. We want to like upgrade the web and uh, move, uh, move the web towards like content addressing and other things, but that's not realistically how things tend to work. If you look back how new technologies got adopted, the old technologies are still around. And all those like on the upgrade path, all the intermediate steps are either around or have been around for a long, long time. And uh, the thing is that now when we are deciding on how to tackle some or how to solve some problems along the, the, this upgrade path, um, we need to do that with awareness that those decisions will be around. We will not, like we could deprecate them, but people will continue uh, using them. And also the actual like coexistence of those new upgrade stages. Um, does it like possess a threat to projects adoption? For example, in this subdomain discussion, Historically, we had a very clear situation where IPFS addressing followed uh, like Unix uh, conventions. So you basically had a root and all addresses were mounted on the same root. Was it like IPFS, IPNS, there are some discussions about slash HTTP uh, and addressing that way. Uh, the, the, the thing was then we've introduced uh, HTTP gateways. So it was pretty easy to simply take this Unix path with, uh, and stack it into the path part of URL. Um, and that was pretty elegant, but at the same time uh, opened a lot of issues due to the fact we ignored origin isolation. And now when we are reintroducing our origin isolation, we are sort of like breaking this pretty abstraction that someone could simply like highlight and copy the path, uh, which were, had a pretty big uh, like usability value, like people could simply change the domain name uh, or, or like copy and paste the path to a different like domain or override the path or added a different gateway and content would still, still load. Now, when we sort of like took CID and stuck it on the left side of this domain, it's like two things to copy, uh, it's not, if you copy the path, it's not the full path because the root is on the domain. Uh, and that's maybe a long, but I think the good example of uh, like a test case uh, of which, which could help us to define those questions. How do we, uh, how do, what questions do we ask ourselves when we make those decision, decisions? Was it, uh, but like worth uh, like the security gain w w was it like more important than this usability tidbit yeah, pro probably from the, from like a, a general sanity way of looking at things but at the same time we've lost on the ux part and then how can we uh, either mitigate that or at least how do we rationalize to ourselves uh, taking those feedbacks on one front uh, while uh, like iterating and improving on the other front. Uh, from the address bar perspective, uh, when there's like either a na native integration or things like that, we could copy uh, a different URL than the one that's present to the user. There are like solutions, but the first step is to um, think about those uh, like arch architectural lock-ins. Um, that we introduce by making those changes. Um, not sure if you, I helped at all, uh, but, but I feel like illustrating why the subdomain gateway situation uh, was pr like pr problematic and uh, 
uh, raise those questions. I feel we should like define some uh, define some uh, guiding principles. Probably like publish them on IPFS in web browsers, uh, like GitHub repo, readme, or some place like that, just to have it uh, at hand when we have to make similar decision at some point in the future. Um, I think that's, that, that those are my thoughts. Uh, I, I have some thoughts on what those guiding principles should be. Uh, we had the historical decisions on like addressing, migration path, uh, but we've never wrote them down. So probably writing them down is a good idea. I think that, that was super helpful for talking about concrete examples of where the, the, the user experience conflicts with other goals and how, at the very least, these principles give us awareness of the trade-offs we're making, as opposed to just making the change to be able to fix the thing reactively at the time. Uh, and I think that that's really important. That'll help. Uh, maybe we should put this on the, uh, put this on the agenda for uh, the team upcoming team meetup, uh, 30 minutes, just to or an hour or something like that during that week to hammer out what these principles might be. That's a good idea. We'll add action item. Uh, in the meantime, there's another agenda item uh, if you valid. I can talk about the that item too, but if you could introduce it, it would be helpful. The local host one? Yes. Yes. So, uh, as you know, there are, are the kind of the, the topology that we have for, for IPFS and web browsers right now is this really this combination of IPFS Companion and IPFS Desktop. And you run IPFS Companion as a way to detect an IPFS URL and then intercept that request, route it over to IPFS Desktop or whatever local daemon you have running, get that response, and then display it back to the user in the browser. This topology results in a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost is that the, the, the URL that the person typed in, whether that's docs.ipfs.io or an IPFS gateway URL, gets redirected to a local host URL. So uh, from, a, from a usability UX standpoint, it's already a little, a little funky. Normal people seeing local host is not really the state that we want to, want to be in for the long term. It's an, it definitely an intermediary. Uh, stage for from that perspective, but also it, it, it means that there's a bunch of quirks in how localhost is handled in browsers with regards to security model redirects uh, all, all kinds of uh, capability detection um, you know uh, that are not not both not not standard across browsers there's some differences there uh, but also not even implementing existing uh, standards to spec uh, so you have both a com a both interoperability and um, uh, spec compliance issues that start to crop up. So uh, we've been trying to now be aware of what those are, kind of where they're blocking us, and where we need to be able to poke at browser vendors to be able to get some of this stuff fixed. Uh, on, the, on the Gecko side, there's a, there's a few bugs here, and they've actually kind of been making some progress recently. Um, and I think Lytle, you poked on some of those, which was good. Uh, but I, for me, it's kind of like, um, I would love to be able to step back and before like leaning too hard into, into local series, at least have like a more cohesive, either, a, either a spec or at least a, some document written up around how we use local host, what the features and capabilities we can expect or need are so that we can present a single unified view that is well documented around the behavior that we need or the behavior that we expect and how we use local host in our topology. Uh, I, I think the last part of that would also be like, what, is it, what does that upgrade path look like? Like where, where do we actually wanna be? The, in, if there's the, it seems like the, the, the world of browsers is we wanna end up at a place where it's IPFS colon slash slash CID uh, and, then, and, then, and then path. Uh, what, is, what, is, what does that look like from communicating what that, Again, we get back to this idea of a lack of a security model or application model that we have really for our uh, threat model for, for what that need of protocol handling looks like. But right now we can kind of use localhost as, local host as a proxy for understanding what that's going to be uh, uh, as at least a midway integration point. So, but I, I think it, what I'd probably like to get to is at the very least, 
documented ex doc documentation for what our expectations are right now and what the known limitations of browsers are. Uh, thank you. So that, that's like super, super useful introduction uh, to the problem space. And the only thing I want to add is uh, those nuances, uh, which I linked. Uh, those nuances, uh, I linked the issues specific to Firefox, uh, mainly because like the Firefox is a remaining piece of the puzzle. Um, so the problem of addressing local node, local gateway. Uh, right now we are basically exposing HTTP gateway to IPFS on local host. And we use that, uh, we use that, uh, it's basically a local host IP and port 8080. The problem with that is um, it's a single origin. <laughs> so when subdomains will land, we hope to have subdomains on localhost. So cid.ipfs.localhost, that solves the origin problem. However, there's a separate problem space uh, related to secure contexts. So secure context uh, is, uh, secure context is another security abstraction in web browsers uh, that acts as a gatekeeper to some more advanced APIs. Uh, and some uh, like operations either from uh, from the page itself, the things that you could do from the JavaScript, the the types of requests you could do, the access to cookies or local storage that you have. Um, secure context uh, in general has a very formal definition, but the short version, the short pragmatic version is that it's either a page loaded from uh, secure transport, so HTTPS uh, with a valid certificate, or a local host, and there's a cave at a small like asterisk around what local host means. So in the initial HTML5 spec, uh, it it was just stated that. Every uh, local uh, says that the secure context is page loaded from uh, HTTPS or page loaded from localhost. But then um, people realize that the localhost itself is just a host name which get, gets passed to operating systems resolver and gets localhost IP from that. And in theory, some like malicious software or so someone could set up operating system or provide a malicious DHT server which could return different IP. And you no longer, you think you are talking to your local machine over a look, look back address, but you are talking with arbitrary IP. Uh, so then to sort of like to plug, plug that uh, security hole, uh, the spec was changed and explicitly stated that only uh, 127.001 and uh, colon colon one, so IPv4 and IPv6 for uh, localhost IPs. Those are hard coded in the spec, and those are hard coded in browser vendor in browser engines. Uh, so only IPs are secure contexts, and the localhost host name for a long time was not, uh, and that's why we are revisiting subdomain gateways uh, this year because it was quite recently when Chrome um, and, and uh, Firefox switched to um, this idea that localhost should not be passed to like local operating system resolver. We already know that it should be a lo lo local lookback. So the browser itself should just like seamlessly translate it to localhost IP. Uh, and when that change got implemented, then browsers are sure this is really local uh, loopback device. And then they could flip the switch and make localhost uh, a secure context again, even when the host name is used. That's a long way to tell that <laughs> host and IP is not interpreted the same by the web browser, but I feel uh, it's useful to know that all this stuff happened 
in the past and why that why it's now that we are making this change and not years back before before localhost was not secure context so the last piece of the puzzle is that localhost it's uh, the name is secure context in both firefox and chromium however only in chromium subdomains on localhost are interpreted as secure contexts so firefox is uh, like lagging behind uh, with implementing the, those changes to guarantee that localhost is the local host and not something else and then uh, populating this uh, uh, blessing that this is a secure context to its subdomains um, so that's the context for the issues i linked um, and like secure context is pretty important if people want to uh, load uh, more advanced uh, web apps, not like static pages, but like web apps that use uh, uh, either like web crypto APIs or like access uh, more advanced uh, APIs uh, that access like probably camera or things like that. Uh, if you want to connect to web sockets, uh, to, if you want to connect to secure web sockets, uh, um, you need to be in secure context. Only JavaScript running in secure context can connect to secure web, uh, web sockets, which means you are not able to connect to bootstrap nodes of uh, lip 2 p if you are not running in uh, running JS IPFS and JS lip 2 p in secure context. So that's the context, why it's important and why, how many like moving pieces are there. Even if we like stop discussing the subdomains, there is this topic of uh, secure context, and we want people to be able to redirect uh, like requests for content address stuff on the web to local gateway, and we don't want people to see that the website broke because access to some APIs is blocked. But people won't care about the fact that it's like not no longer secure context. Uh, people we should not break uh, stuff that people put on the IPFS. We probably should uh, make everything in our power to make sure if we redirect to local gateway to ensure uh, the data, uh, like the pages and the user experience is not blocked and we don't decrease like security uh, isolation that people had on the regular web. Um, I think that's it. I, ho <laughs> I hope it was useful. Thanks for the, the deep dive. I really, for, for me, this really kind of begs this question that we haven't really fully answered yet, which is like, what are the expectations around an application model and the capabilities of an application model and the compatibility of a web application model for an IPFS resource? If you load something that's like so much, so much of IPFS is used outside of the web context, where there's no expectations of any of this actually working, like it's not being rendered in the context of a user visible web page. But here, when you do load an IPFS resource through an HTTP URL, there's an expectation that things like linked JavaScript files will be loaded and this code executed. <laughs> or things like linked CSS files will be loaded and applied by the rendering engine. So you pull in this entire, all these assumptions about world A, when really you're just trying to load a resource from world B, which is IPFS, where we actually have no defined re requirements around any type of handling what the, or expectations around what the content is from a MIME type perspective, let alone how it will be treated in a specific rendering context. Uh, we, we dictate none of that. We're just a pipe at that point. Mr. Nesbitt. Would it be a useful exercise to kind of imagine what choices would be made if um, IPFS, the web browser, was made without kind of considering legacy and like uh, integration choices as looking at like, obviously the upgrade path eventually gets to where you want to be, but where would you ideally want to be versus where can you like, obviously some doors can just be shut and like, oh, it's incredibly hard to open again. Uh, but like maybe that could be just a useful brainstorm to to kind of go like, in an ideal world, we'd be here. In an ideal world, if you put a web page, if you try and load a web page through the gateway that references other, like Google CDN for jQuery, like, do we even want, like, do you need to opt in to load that stuff rather than that be the default, which like, 
if you're questioning the way that you're doing the web, then maybe like that's an interesting kind of exercise. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. That, that's why a lot of times I try to couch this conversation in the context of what an IPFS colon slash slash should result in. That, because that, that's a point where we get to redefine what those expectations are. We, we, we don't have to accept the old model. And we really should learn from what did or did not work. And, and that vision of what we think the web in 50 years should be, what will provide the longevity and the characteristics of, of content delivery in a safer world safer, more resilient way. Right. Uh, so again, like, th this is a long, long question. We're gonna, not going to answer it in this meeting. But localhost and how it's handled in browser vendors in, in different browsers is a really good example of where we really start to hit these barriers. And the fact that we don't have a well-defined application model for IPFS starts being um, we, we start to hit, hit we, we start to really feel that gap in our plan. I also like find that uh, Andrew had a very good um, good idea with thinking how would we create this like web, web browsing experience uh, if we forgot about like existing legacy situation and, and the, f the fact that pretty nice over overlap between that line of thinking and the work that uh, uh, you are doing the trick with uh, browser uh, design guidelines, uh, namely the stuff that we've already identified that like the, you know, on the old web, you got those like guarantee of transport not being changed, but, but you don't actually get any integrity guarantees in IPFS. You, you, would, you would have to come up with some ways of communicating that, that the, there are integrity guarantees and uh, transport guarantees. However, you have a different privacy uh, guarantees than you had in the old model. Um, also could be a workshop for Team Week, just saying. Yeah, I, th I think that would be fun. Uh, one of the other things that really came up out of, you know, the, with the browser design guidelines, we really kind of level set. We're like, what does the world look like today? Let's be really clear and, and formal about identifying what the expectations, assumptions, uh, and what's changeable and not in the concept of a browser URL bar. Uh, and one of the gaps that came up there, or not, not really gap, but one of the, one of the really important parts was um, this added, added integrity guarantee. It's new to the web. Uh, but also a, a complete deferral of the trust model. So whether we agree with the DNS trust model, which is that you paid somebody for a certificate and that person actually checked that the owner of the, of the domain name uh, actually has an address and is a valid business and all this stuff, which we all know really isn't true and the advent of let's encrypt made it even less true that that there that, that, that there's any you know trust built in necessarily from a verification standpoint that somebody is an actual real business somebody went and checked on that and that's the value of that certificate um, it, so that that problem aside the existing world assumes that trust model exists and at IPFS we've taken that trust model where that where do you put your trust and we put it out of band it's out of view now and that onus of that trust is put on the user to be able to, where did I get the CID from? Do I trust that person? Is the, it's all up to me now, as opposed to at least having like some framework, some business incentive around. Just leading trust. us down the blockchain path here. Yeah. I, I'm just identifying a place where it's a barrier to adoption for us. And we need to be aware when we're designing a solution for it. So if you're, if we if my job is to convince a security team and a, and a design team at Google to implement IPFS. I need to be able to explain what the nature of the change in the user experience is with regards to how they make decisions. Should I trust this URL or not? And right now, even though we have a, a system for that trust that is fallible, that has known problems, there's at least a system. But with IPFS, we've said, whoop, that's out of view, not my job. So until we have a, a better answer for where to place that trust, how to a user should make decisions around whether they should trust what they got from a CID or not, we need to at least design for it to be like, hey, this might not be safe. 
we can't we can't say either way. And from a design and a security design standpoint, we need to design a user experience uh, that that is very clear about that about how little how we don't know in order to it be able to protect like, the user. It feels like that at some point, and I don't really know the history, and I'd be interested in finding out if anyone is aware um, that IPNS at some point was like, oh, this is the quick fix for all of those things and DNS link and like was partly done and then just like has been never really like completed to the point of actually being useful for anything. Uh, that, that, that at least coming from like when I first started looking at the whole thing last year and especially thinking about like how does this connect with with talking to things over the internet uh package management but also for websites is like naming things to connect with humans is like a significant point of and then that name having like having some trust in that name being um <laughs> reliable and like someone else's problem or at least like can uh be bound to the real world uh is um it feels like it's never really been followed up but i suspect it's just because we've got stuck in everything else and haven't come back around yet i think it's a interesting observation that we, we sort of every time we talk about this uh like the presence of IPFS in web browser and then uh, trusting someone uh, who gave me a link with a CAD for like for me sort of like the abstract the way I talked with uh, less technical people was that like uh, just like right now you are not pasting URLs with raw IPs to people you probably won't be pasting or very rarely be pasting uh, links with raw CIDs, unless you want like a specific snapshot of a website. Uh, so this discussion about like human readable names is never ending, and we probably need to figure it out. Like today, we like IPNS was not an answer to this uh, problem. Like it was not an answer. It was not a full answer to a human readable names problem. It was just a way of having static address that points at the content that could change like it was just a static pointer at, con at some content and then on top of that we have a dns link which is basically a bridge between dns uh, and ipfs and you could point either at ipns or ipfs paths uh, we got of course blockchain solution <laughs> which is ens uh, However, that like requires bundling a uh, light client, which is not feasible. Uh, like right now, we are not bundling Ethereum client with IPFS companion. So basically, DNS link is the only solution for human readable names, and it's bridging that gap from the old web to the new web. The question is, is that enough? Uh, it feels like a, the weakest link in our entire stack when it comes to the browser integrations. Uh, maybe because we are not adopting uh, DNSSEC, maybe uh, that for a reason. Uh, I think it's uh, another topic for a longer discussion. <laughs> we probably should uh, pause at this if we want to fi fit into this uh, hour. Also, we need to finish five minutes earlier uh, today. Uh, so I'll put a a dot on that conversation here and let's move uh, to the I, next one thank you for adding an action to the notes to discuss this more fully at our next in-person meeting all right uh did you do you want to talk about ipfs dev grants yeah uh, oh, I'll actually add the URL to the notes as well. 
Uh, we are beta testing the FPFS Dev Grants program uh, within the area of browsers, connectivity, web UI, and desktop. We have a number of projects that we have said we have long, long wanted to be able to do X, but we don't have time and we keep not getting around to doing X. Uh, if you have ideas for projects that are either uh, micro grant size that can be done under $1,000 uh, US, if uh, you have ideas for projects maybe a little bigger uh, that you might be considered a larger grant that would be worth investing in or you think even somebody else who is not part of IPFS and PL might be investing in, or if you just have a, a request, then you would like people to bring proposals to the table for a given technical problem, uh, whether anybody out there might actually see business value in it, want to actually invest real money put it behind getting to see that problem solved. The IPFS Dev Grants repo is now open for business. It's currently in beta stage, but there are, it's being used for things like bounties for documentation. Uh, it's being used for, um, it's gonna be used for some of the work that we wanna be able to see happen in our Brave integration, uh, as well as a number of other things. The Rust IPFS implementation uh, is being proposed as a IPFS Dev Grant as well. So in the course of your work, if there are those things that are project sized that you think that would be worth investing in, but we don't have the time to be able to do that right now because it's maybe a lower priority than what we have for this next quarter or two, think about writing it up as a IPFS Dev Grant where somebody might walk up, have the relevant experience, have the interest in time, and we would be interested in paying them to be able to do that work and uh, bring that value and success back to the project. And help us move some of these some of these things we've had on the back burner for a long time. Help us move them forward, even if they're experiments. I would encourage you to think of like you know like one of the things I'm like so someday we'll just have a bunch of browsers all running HTTP pages where they're connected using IPFS over DHT over WebRTC and that might be fine for a given use case. It might not be fine for a use case A, but it might be perfect for use case B, especially when a bunch of people load a bunch of things up at the same time in the same place. It might work out great. I would love to see some experimentation around that. So if you have these types of ideas, we're like, ah, it's not even a fully formed idea, but I would like to see somebody do an experiment in, in that area, write it up as a possible dev grant. And could be said, uh, us or somebody else uh, wants to perfectly match with an interested party and fund that experiment, make proof of concept. I just want to add that it's not only about uh, like, uh, we as a PFS project or the P2P project can propose uh, chunks of work that we'd like to see, but people can propose their own projects. And what's important is it's not only about uh, like fully fledged projects, but there are those like micro grants. If you have a project which could have IPFS integration added and you want to, that work to be sponsored, that's a special type of grant that also could be proposed. Uh, details on the repo. Yeah, there's a like a, there's an issue like next cloud is a great example where next cloud users there's a subset of them that are like I just want my stuff on IPFS I don't want to have to do this other thing and I, um, I keep meaning to port that from the IPFS mini projects repo and move just move that issue over into Dev Grant so I think that may be something where people in that community would would be really interested in in doing that work and seeing it happen. I love that idea of integrations as dev grants. Cool, cool. I may feel some things there soon, so pretty excited. Uh, I, th I think this, this next agenda item is me also. Uh, th this is something that is more, more hand wavy. Uh, so I, I meet with Microsoft regularly. They're rolling out uh, an identity platform solution uh, called using a technology called SideTree, uh, and their implementation of it I think is going to be called Ion. They announced it last year, um, and it's basically identity transactions are aggregated, written to the Bitcoin blockchain, and all of the logs of those transactions are actually hosted from IPFS nodes that currently uh, Microsoft is running. It's JSIPFS running as a daemon on, on the server side that they're using to host these CIDs, basically. And the CIDs are written to the Bitcoin blockchain for, for now as their initial rollout. But I guess they, they say that you could write it anywhere. Uh, it's, it's interesting. The, they're using JSIPFS because that's the tool chain and platform and language that their whole team and the whole area works with. Uh, they are, they're all TypeScript up and down, so they're interested in our TypeScript support as well. Uh, but a type of support for JSIPFS. Uh, 
but also this topology is kind of strange. Like not a lot of people are deploying JSIPFS on the server, running it in production, because JSIPFS doesn't have DHT support, so it can't actually connect to the actual DHT. Uh, if the clients to this implementation bootstrap to Microsoft's nodes, then it's great. They connect to the Microsoft's IPFS nodes, they request the CID, those nodes obviously have the CID, boom, problem solved. However, they need to be able to scale this network farther and further. Uh, so they're very interested in, in us implementing more feature parity in JSIPFS and, and their JSLA P2P is obviously a huge part of the connectivity standpoint and some of the DHT work as well. Uh, but also this topology ends up being confusing to communicate. Um, in, in, in this use case, even though JSIPFS is uh, not directly connected to the DHT, you can still make a request for the CIDs from, this, from the Bitcoin blockchain that Microsoft has written there through this identities framework. Uh, you can form a gateway URL and ask a, our public gateway, for example, for that CID. And it's possible due to these nodes being connected to other nodes uh, when they do initial peer discovery and start walking and gathering all these peers, that in these 700 peers, they're one of those is, are, are some of those are going to be Go IPFS nodes that are connected to DHD. And therefore, this routing from, say, Bitcoin blockchain, get the CID, ask the public IPFS gateway for that CID might actually connect eventually and it will take a little while, but probably resolve by connecting eventually to one of the nodes that's connected to Microsoft's network or one of the partners who are also running nodes because this is an open, open system. Not only Microsoft servers are gonna be there. Uh, so we have this topology where they're not actually connected to DHT, but actually the system kind of works. It's not gonna work great and might not work all the time. Uh, but communicating about one, this, the feature parity thing is, is kind of a, uh, we don't really have a good, a solid understanding of where exactly these connection types kind of break down and where a JSIPFS node isn't interchangeable with a GoIPFS node. And I think some of our users don't know the differences there really and what those differences mean. And they can say, stand something up, and implement it. And they're like, hey, look, it works. I wrote a client and, and it bootstrapped it to my server and the system works. But if they're not connected to a Go DHT, Go connected, you know, GoNet is connected to DHT somewhere along the line, that gateway scenario, where they actually request that same CID from a gateway, might not work. And these types of nuances in implementation, deployment, standing up IPFS solutions for whatever your needs are, here in, in this case, a global decentralized identity system, um, it, it, they're not clear to implementers and builders. Uh, I would love it if anybody has resources, uh, ideas, uh, or work you've done or work you know of around kind of the visualization of these topologies of what these connection limitations are. I, I would really love to be able to have, be able to point to diagrams, uh, interactive visualizations, maybe this is an idea for a dev grant even, of what connect, how these connections actually work sometimes. So like in, in this given scenario where you have a JSIP vest node running on a server somewhere, it's connected using our default connection uh, configuration it's got a few hundred peers it's connected to. Then you take a CID that it's hosting and you public and you ask for it through the gateway. How, how does that routing actually work? How does it find its way from the gateway all to all the way to this node that maybe that's even a JSIPFS node that's published it from inside of a web page through the HTTP, a, HTTP API? Uh, wh what, what are the possible ways that, that the request can route through the system and eventually performance concerns aside, actually connect and, and resolve that, that content? Um, you know, I think the, the default assumption for a lot of us that are running IPFS in high volume, high production uh, scenarios is that you just have to run a, you just have to run a go IPFS node. That, that's the only way it's going to work. But that's not really often, the, that, that's not all the time the case. And, and here we have a case where we have somebody who's built something with IPFS, but uh, all, they're like, what? We just use JS IPFS and our, our, it's working for our use case. But it's not, it's not clear. So in the conversation with, say, the core Go team is, well, that's crazy, right? They're just using Go IPFS. And there's a whole lot of reasons why people choose JSIPFS. For example, when your entire ecosystem is built in JavaScript and all your hires and your hiring pipeline is built in JavaScript and all your tooling is oriented around JavaScript, there's a huge investment in JavaScript as, as an ecosystem. And not only that, from programming perspective, it and Python are the two biggest ecosystems in that regard. So having really strong support for it is really important for us from an adoption standpoint. But then there's also this, it's kind of like network visualization and, 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 and deployment topology visualization thing. So there's a couple of stuff wrapped up here, but I, I think I just primarily added this as like, I don't have good tools to be able to communicate 
these deployment topologies, how that routing actually works. So if you have thoughts, ideas, resources that you can share, good examples, um, if, if you are good at scrawling and want to draw some of this out as with stick figures, you can take that to a designer, have them make it prettier, uh, but any help here would, would be so awesome. Yeah, um, so I think like you could have talked about, there's multiple things here. Like one is like actual network visualization. And that is something that is currently in the works from the libp2p layer is we, um, we are working on finishing up instrumentation of libp2p um, because we need this for test ground. And then that is also going to um, be incorporated into a um, visualizer that we already have design comps of. Um, but we didn't have the instrumentation to provide um, to the um, team that's going to be helping us build out that visualization. So we should eventually in the near future, um, I don't remember the timeline, but it's within the next six months, get instrumentation done so we can hand that off so that they can plug it in and actually build out a network visualizer for this. And then I think there's the second part of this, which is like, hey, if you want to get content and you end up getting content but you're not running a dht how does that happen and like what's going on because there's probably like maybe it's bit swap magic or it's delegated routing whatever's going on here um there's like some combination of things that's getting you that content and it's usually a combination of things especially in jsipfs in in jsipfs there's like it, yeah it's all the stuff that we have in JS p 2 p but also we got pre something for called preloads. So there's the fact that you can ask some remote node to fetch content to its cache from you. And then you don't really like announce anything to the DHT, but effectively by the fact that that node fetched that content and stored it in local repo, that node started announcing that stuff to DHT. So that's, that's basically like, like delegated uh, content routing works. No, I think uh, in conjunction with uh, preload nodes. So there's, those are like two pieces of the puzzle. Uh, one is like uh, uh, passively asking for a content and that's the, the delegated uh, um, module from lip 2 p and then on the JS IPFS side, when you add the stuff to your local node, you can have a list of preload nodes which automatically will prefetch content from your node. So this diagram that uh, Dietrich described is even more complex and we will have even more arrows and boxes there if we not only talk about like vanilla JS IPFS, but also add this overlay of uh, like data in IPFS, it could be maybe interactive, like toggle, you could like show or hide layers. Uh, I may be uh, working on some visuals for a Brave blog post, which has some uh, of those things like uh, preload nodes, uh, delegated routing modules for lp 2 p So that may be like the first iteration of trying to squeeze as many boxes into one picture and we will probably iterate on that and make it uh, like more generalized version which could have effect uh, at some point be published on our docs um, yeah that, jacob can you add links to the to the notes here to where we can follow along with that work the the p2p network visualizer, visualizer work yes i think a lot of it hasn't been publicized yet um all right but i will let me I'll hunt down some links we have some cool. stuff awesome thanks yeah this is unfortunately so much of this currently is magic but um the, it, it and stuff like this ma magic is a bug Ma yeah, well, and it's like, yeah, it's not really, it's not so much magic. I think it's just like, it's very unclear what those stories are, right? Like when I add content to the network, what's the story for that content getting onto the network? Um, and then what's the story for it coming back? Because it's the more we add to IPFS2, like the more convoluted it's going to get because you have something like BitSwap, which is just calls like, if it can't find it locally or amongst its close peers, it will go ask libp2p. Uh, content routing 
to find this thing and libp2b content routing could be a dht it could be delegated routing it could be something else in the future like it could be any series of that and so it's like plugging all of that in and saying like this is specifically what jsipfs is going to do and these are the two stories um that get you that content all right awesome. thanks i'm just thing. really glad some somebody's doing some of that and we're getting a little bit closer i think we'll, we'll get there eventually the good thing is that we got two and a half minutes to spare. So great timing, guys. Thank you for being here. And hopefully see you next time, next week, same time. It's always great. Just me. See you all. Bye. Have a great Bye. week.